nosso último nível que é meio ruim miras nunca disse só querendo ir para ter para hoje para para valer um e para mim mas não tenho a qualidade hoje não ligar não sei eu mais miras não ligar que tem que matar miras não matar fãs com calat para já acho que já vou ser me me fazer para isso isso é bom Good evening. It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, I'm impressed by the uh, organization and the ongoing events here in Pristina, so it's very nice to be a part of it. So I'm going to present the work of my office and somehow uh, I would like to share some ideas with you. So this is the name of our office. We are operating in Zagreb in Croatia uh, and uh, this is where we come from. Uh, this is uh, the symbol of our state, this checkered field actually is our ancient symbol and somehow the, the time changes and this is the new, the, the redesigned flag of Republic of Croatia uh, based on that symbol. So just to give you a couple of hints uh, about Croatia and the cultural uh, circumstances that I come from, and this is the main square in the city of Zagreb. Uh, actually uh, a fine collection of different styles, different epochs, all gathered together in one place. So the uniqueness of this space is actually uh, the, this collection of different styles who are peacefully coexisting next to each other. So we have historicism, Art Nouveau, modernism uh, and some classical buildings all on the same square. In the same time uh, it is also interesting to observe a certain uh, processes uh, somehow associated with the idea of a socialist city. This is uh, from a textbook on urbanism uh, showing a typical uh, socialist city. Actually Zagreb has been chosen as the model for that. Uh, the images is actually turned slightly uh, upside down. The north is on the, on the left side. And actually it shows the development of this decentralized city and the new quarters uh, designed to uh, house the new demands of, of the new epoch. <clears throat> In the same time, uh, one of the streets that uh, emerged just after the World War II uh, was uh, the street where all the modernists of the time uh, did their buildings. And actually it has proven to be a f very fine set for a movie uh, shot by uh, American director Orson Welles for his famous film The Trial. So these are the stills from the movie. And actually these are the buildings that we encounter here. As you can see it's a kind of a reference of the classical modernism, uh, of a reference to Unité by Le Corbusier. Actually in a Croatian version it's a triplex unit somewhat differently packed together to fit all the demands of this place. Uh, another city in Croatia which actually is a place of interest, this is the place where I teach. It's called Split, it's on the coast. And it's here, this is an image of a Diocletian's palace uh, from the second century. Uh, and actually uh, the phenomenon about this space is that actually what was the palace of the emperor, the, the house for one, uh, throughout the centuries became a city for, 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 for everyone, right? So actually it shows quite clearly uh, the strength of the structure which can stand, withstand the, the test of time. You can still see the Cardo and the Comanus and all the ancient buildings and basilicas uh, placed in the center of this uh, rectangular field. So actually it's also uh, a very uh, fine uh, uh, piece of, of investigation of the, of the urban research and has also been a topic of different workshops throughout the time, also uh, curated by the modernists such as Aldo van Eyck, Hermann, van, uh, Hermann Herzberger and people like that. In City of Split we can also learn from the more contemporary times, this, these are the 60s, where the modernist towers are actually equipped all what actually the contemporary life needs. So you see the, the, the linen being dried, you see the air conditioning units which somehow fulfill this uh, imagery of modernism in a, 
I would say, quite appropriate way. It doesn't spoil the image of, 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 of this entity. Uh, some of the phenomena that are interesting to follow are, for example, the balconies that people sell to each other. So you can, if you don't need it, you can sell your balcony to your neighbor. So it's very interesting to, sh to follow this transition of, of ownerships from one hand to the other, also equipped with, a, with an appropriate design. So these are all the lessons that we as architects, and my students, of course, as well, can learn from such examples. Living and working in the same space, a garage that has been appropriated to a kind of a working uh, space is also some of the lessons of this impromptu uh, urbanism that we have over there. In a period of, of homeland war, in the 90s, there was a lot of uh, 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 emergency uh, 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 building that somehow emerged uh, in this time as kind of an ephemeria. And we also learned uh, quite a lesson from there. The idea of, of instability, uh, the idea of a building that somehow evolves and some then uh, disappears in time. The idea of, of trade, of, of this informal, informal uh, way of, of, of dealing with, with commerce uh, in, a, in a, our coastal cities on the Adriatic. The idea that we can use the table tennis table in very different ways, that we can use it also for reclining, not to forget the little doggy down there who also enjoys the shadow. So these are the lessons that you have to observe with the eyes of the architects in order to be able to extrapolate them into a new design. Uh, finally, uh, a beer pyramid, also an ephemeral building that stood for a couple of weeks, made out of <coughs> plastic yellow boxes made for beer, that are assembled together like a ziggurat, lit from the inside and somehow emerging like some sort of a magical appearance in the night, which gives you an idea how a ready-made uh, 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 way of, of, of composition actually could be maintained in a very successful way. I'm also interested in territory and a big um, amount of my work is also uh, concentrated on these things. So, uh, territory is, is inevitably linked with names, with people, with identity that people offer the space. For example, the territory distribution of, of territory and the way how we map it is also a, a kind of a tool that we use in architecture. And this map, for example, is a distribution of, of McDonald's restaurants in the US. Uh, the idea of relabeling, of, of giving the, the certain sites some different labels, is a kind of a game of, of uh, giving uh, some sort of uh, freedom to reinterpret the site from its initial meaning. The idea of density is a very important tool in, in, in urban design and we use it very often. The idea of void, the idea of of uh, uh, infill of the city, the city fabric that has certain anonymity and somehow is only recognized by the void space between them. The idea of void as a kind of an articulated uh, a vacuum that we somehow filled with meaning, we charge it with, with meaning. Uh, the idea of a scale that also plays a, a, an important role in, in as well as in urban design, as in, in, in the design of the buildings as such. The idea of power in the public space, this is a main square in the city of Kabul, showing a kind of a, a, a masculine power that somehow rules the city. Or the idea of surveillance, uh, an image from uh, Harvard campus, which also shows another way how to control and monitor the space. The idea to recognize the uh, existing uh, natural scars in the territory that we can reappropriate for some events. In this particular example uh, from Sweden, uh, the architects simply had to recognize the potential of this pit and to uh, stage a number of events within this uh, uh, man-made arena. The idea of infrastructure is also an important uh, way how to uh, 
equip our spaces with, with uh, uh, necessary uh, installments. The idea how to uh, ban or to enable uh, the use of the space, an example from uh, Russia, or another example uh, from uh, Toronto, giving you a kind of, a, sorry, from, from Calgary, uh, giving you an idea that this sort of uh, oppression, how to use the public space, and especially dealing with homelessness, is uh, something that transcends the politics, the, the nationalities, and actually could be found everywhere. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, a slide from the city of Dubrovnik shows that public space and the way how people congregate could happen in a very informal way. It only uh, takes to have a couple of steps and, and a waiter who serves food and drinks to stage life in a very successful way. The idea how to appropriate the space, uh, very close to the idea of situationists, uh, how to uh, uh, try to understand the psychogeography of the space. Uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, it's called guerrilla knitting. The, the idea of how to uh, identify uh, your piece of, of, of space. Uh, also, the companies uh, take part in this uh, game of relabeling. This is an example how IKEA was uh, also involved in, a, in, a, in an event where a bus station has been staged as a living room. The living room is just uh, around the corner. It's also a kind of an ad for a bank in Zagreb, which also gives you an idea of this immediacy of public and private being so close to each other. The idea of, of, of organizing the space, uh, which was in the 50s uh, or 60s, a kind of a systematic design by ArcZoom, then today we are more to see the space in this way, with a lot of irregularities, with not so clear uh, instructions how to use it. So this is more a kind of illustration of a space that we have to deal with today or the idea of self-organization, which is also coming from the, from the science of complexity. The idea how to self-organize the flows in space was a kind of a pilot project in Austria, where a, a, a street crossing was left without the traffic signs and traffic lights. And uh, the, the idea was how to, to observe the behavior of the drivers, of the pedestrians, and everyone involved in this uh, mechanism of traffic to see how it works and actually it has been proven that the number of accidents uh, uh, diminished. It is also about obstructions that we see in our space, for example, uh, a movie by Lars von Trier which speaks about these obstructions in a very, I would say, spirited way gives us a clue how we as architects can also sort of uh, conceptualize these obstructions and how to transform them into kind of a positive tool in our design. And finally, uh, is this tree, which is in the middle of this football pitch, a kind of a obstacle? Or does this game of football has lost anything of its uh, dynamics by the, the fact that the tree is, is in the middle of, of the sporting ground or not? This is a question that every one of us has to answer for himself. Uh, just shortly to give you, uh, as a presentation of myself, uh, an idea about my uh, other aspects of, of activity is also teaching. Uh, since recently I have been a regular uh, teacher in the uh, city of Madrid in a postgraduate course of, of uh, housing. Uh, I also had directed a very uh, nice uh, workshop not so far away from here, in uh, Macedonia, in the town of Kriva Palanka, where we actually, with, uh, with a group of international students, uh, worked in a workshop uh, under the title uh, 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 Learning by Doing. Uh, and we somehow uh, managed to uh, design and put together two social structures for gypsies, which are the predominant uh, uh, part of, of, of inhabitants of this uh, little town. Uh, 
So we work with what we haven't found in the space, and uh, we uh, uh, also somehow included the, the existing population into the design process as a kind of a participation, which is a very fashionable word these days. So they somehow contributed this idea of making this little social uh, focal space uh, and uh, it was a kind of a big lesson for us as teachers, for the students and for the community involved in this uh, design process and implementation. Uh, recently I, I also uh, th taught in, in uh, Toronto, in the U of T. Uh, where I somehow started to uh, develop my interest for uh, contemporary utopias. So this was the title of, of, of my studio, called Affordable Utopias, which I then uh, followed in MIT last year, where we were dealing with the city of Marfa in Texas, which is known for as a, as a hometown to the famous collection by Donald Judd. So we uh, worked in uh, the idea of how to implement the social collective housing in Texas. So this was a, also a kind of a big revelation what you can do in the US concerning the, the, the social collective housing and I think that also the students enjoyed the work. Now I will uh, show you uh, actually the, the title of my lecture is Concepts. So, my uh, uh, ambition is to show you different concepts in different scales related, of course, to the projects of my office, somehow uh, uh, dealing with different scales and different topics. The first one deals with urban morphology, typology shift and trash culture. This is a project from the late 90s uh, about the hypermarket in the uh, country of Slovenia. Uh, in the city of Maribor. So we somehow tried to work in the idea of typology, working with this uh, American-US model, uh, uh, coined for the first time by Victor Grün, uh, who actually invented the, 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 the typology of the supermarket. And we, in this uh, little sketch, you can see how we reappropriated uh, his uh, design into something what we eventually call the European model. So what was in the US in the 1950s, in Europe, uh, becomes something else. What was a kind of a concrete shack in this uh, uh, asphalt desert with a few occasional trees? Uh, we uh, turned it another way around. We actually uh, filled the site with a substance, then we excavated the parking lots, we put the greenery on the top, and we have these, uh, all the, the perimeter parts are completely mute and full and all the parts which have been cut out are completely glazed in order to respond to the visitors. So this is the idea of an architecture as a subtraction, not as an addition. So it is also, I would say, a relevant design method, how to design by subtracting rather than by adding the elements into a kind of a composition. So this is the appropriation of this principle to the very site, also with these four little things which are actually the big uh, billboards which are anchoring this green typo topography uh, to the site. This, this was the end of 90s, everybody was speaking about landscaping, everybody was into this sort of uh, green uh, 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 frenzy, so we somehow decided to give our own version of, of that landscaping thing in this project. So this is the, the green roof of this undulating topography on, on the upper part. These are the glazed parts which actually respond to the visitors. This is, these are the billboards which anchor the whole structure. They are really pretty big. This is the, actually the whole uh, layout showing the principle which I have mentioned already. This is the model showing the same thing. And our fascination with these everyday objects, with, with uh, ready-mades, with uh, everydayness as a phenomenon as such, also somehow played a kind of a decisive role in our design process. As you can see here, this idea of the airport as a kind of a, a, a place of inspiration. 
which we transposed into uh, our building. Then we definitely are interested in trash, but the one on your right hand side, the trash actually which brings meanings. There are a number of examples which can uh, show us this. An example from Brescia, Italy, showing kind of a scaffolding is a kind of magical appearance of this house that doesn't look as good as it does in this image when the scaffolding is away. An example from Paris, an example from Venice, another example from Venice, and also from Paris, sorry. The idea of accumulating uh, the containers uh, with a sort of a, a fabric, which almost is like a, like a setting ready for some projections and some sort of archigrammesque sort of space. Then examples from New York, another from the Ground Zero, uh, showing this sort of a black building. This, this has been uh, uh, covered in, uh, before it's been demolished uh, as an effect of 9-11 events. It gives you a kind of an idea of temporality as well which somehow uh, brings us closer to the idea of the facade that we designed for this uh, hypermarket in Maribor. Actually, these are the reflecting panels that you find uh, along the, or on the uh, uh, sideways of, of uh, uh, motorways, which are silver on one side, red on the other, depending on the side of the street. And we decided to take these panels as ready-mades and to put them into the house. When you observe them from one side, they glow uh, red. When you put them on the, see them from the other side, they glow in the silvery uh, uh, shine, which actually uh, is an idea that uh, there are no pedestrians uh, uh, encircling the house. There are also there are only uh, people in the car. So this sort of a movement, uh, which is uh, strictly uh, uh, related to the cars uh, and to the cars that are lighting the building is a kind of a comment and also gives a kind of a clear uh, definition of the house as something which has to do with automotive culture. So this, these are these images from the night when the buildings shine and glow in this uh, magical appearance. Another project deals with uh, the shaping of accelerated digestion and interprets the suburbia. As you might guess, it is about McDonald's. We were asked to do a little McDonald's shack again in the city of Maribor in Slovenia. So we decided to apply these huge golden arches as a kind of a binding element between the down, lower level and the higher level. The blue one is the normal McDonald's drive-in restaurant and the white one is, is, a football, uh, is a basketball field which we put on top of it as a kind of an interpretation of American culture somehow united on this very spot. Okay. Also we work with fabrics and different things. For example, this is a very influential uh, image from the church Santa Maria del Mar in Barcelona. Uh, also some examples from a rural uh, area in Germany or in, from Mexico City gives a kind of an idea that these meshes which are topping the structures could be uh, used also in our build house. So this is the sketch for the project, also with these opening parts as a typical shack that closes down when it's not operating. Brings us to the final materialization of the project and the way how it sits in its urban uh, environment, in this sort of chaotic suburban uh, access roads in the city of Maribor. The third project is about urban morphology, domestic culture, and again, interpretation of suburbia. As you might have might know, eventually there is this famous Buell uh, report uh, or hypothesis which deals with this uh, housing uh, transformations in US, which also coins some new uh, thinking on housing as such. As a, as a way of organizing the houses as, as a collective uh, uh, venue. And we somehow uh, picked up a certain uh, aspects of this uh, research and appropriated it for this little site in the outskirts of the city of Zagreb. 
where we were asked to do a little settlement, which we eventually called a rural mat. Rural because it actually was a part of the once existing village, which became a part, a part of the stroll, metropolitan stroll, sprawl, sorry. <coughs> and Matt somehow uh, giving homage to the work uh, of Alison Peter Smithsons, who came out with this idea of a mat building as a low, flat, uh, uh, congested, uh, very uh, clearly structured uh, system which we appropriated for this uh, nice piece of land, uh, somehow articulated with two river flows on your left and on your right hand side. So this is the process that deals with, uh, with urban rules that we had to appropriate to arrive. So we, st we started it with the semi-detached houses here. And we reworked this semi-detached type of house by uh, taking out the, the voids, uh, articulating the parts that has to be uh, part of the uh, open space, be it the garden, atrium, or the terrace, and by manipulating the vol volumes, uh, also fulfilling the maximum occupancy of the site, we finally came to this model that we, as I said, call urban uh, rural mat. This is the way how we transform this archetypal uh, model of the house into something appropriated for this very site. This is one of the mats that we have. There are four of them on the site. This is how they sit on this site. The view of the model showing this variety of open uh, uh, spaces, uh, giving you an idea of living in the countryside. Also articulating the fireplaces as something that has to do with this outward living. We even designed a prefab fireplace for the barbecues, uh, coming from the fact that we are irritated by the low uh, amount, low uh, 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 choice in the market. So these are the simulations of the whole structure and the finally executed uh, plan. Uh, giving different ways how to deal with public and semi-public space. Different ideas, also, also always maintaining this idea of relation to the center of the, of the village with the church in, in the site. And also this image shows the variety of entrances. Every apartment has its own individualized entrance. So we call this uh, uh, exercise uh, uh, individual living in the group because we somehow tend to individualize them as much as we can. So these are some of the images of the carports where we take the cars away from the side of the street in the cheapest possible way. The entrances uh, made out of warm timber on the entrance side and made out of uh, uh, aluminium on the uh, weather side. So this is some detailing of different cladding of the house. The next one deals with architecture as a process, illegal as a potential. So it's again about the gypsies, about the Roma. Uh, believe it or not, the city of Zagreb uh, once uh, made a competition with a theme of a, a cultural center for the gypsies. In the middle of the area, which is mostly occupied by illegal houses, made by them. For you here, uh, the idea of illegal is not so uh, new or not so uh, exciting. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that it's even more than important because we are sort of trying to give a kind of a clue how to work with these sort of obstacles in a way, or try to reformulate them into a kind of a, uh, advantage that we have in our design process. So this was the site which was designated for the center, but and this is the way how the gypsies work. We are familiar with that, I suppose. So this was the site, but alas, the gypsies, as they are, they didn't know anything about the competition. So in the meantime, they constructed some of their houses in the in the competition area. So for the competitors, it was a big moral dilemma: shall we try to pretend that nothing has been built and we simply design the center? Or shall we somehow give some sort of uh, uh, amnesty for the 
illegal, and try to uh, insert our cultural center as a kind of a coexistence of both. So this is what we actually went for. We tried different formats. We tried to recognize this interstitial space in between. So we tried in the, this middle image with, with a band, which has proven to be too tiny for the structures and problems that was requested. So finally we came the idea of, of with the idea of a wall with some prefab shacks attached to this wall. This is the site. These are these almost uh, um, uh, 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 structures that you can buy in a, in, a, in a store. And you can put them there. You see the delineating element of the wall, which somehow connects and divides at the same time. And the stress on the public space, which remains like a kind of a void, like a kind of opportunity in between of them. We equip the void with the more or less standard uh, urban furnishings and actually we, we left the stage open for them to fill it with a lot of festivities and special uh, way and, and special uh, celebrations that are somehow characteristic of this population so we simply are staging, we are setting the stage for them to fill it and to bring life into the settlement and into the center. So this is the idea of, of how to work with them. Now I will tell you uh, very shortly about contextuality and everydayness, which seem to be uh, some of our principal things in our design. Uh, for the uh, uh, Salon of Zagreb Architecture, which happens to uh, be held uh, every three, three years in the city of Zagreb, as the winners of the previous uh, session, we were allowed to construct a little pavilion. So we somehow decided to make it to promote three things with this pavilion. This is the, 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 the outline of the pavilion. This is the, the table, this is a, the Nelson table. This is the position very near to the main square which you have seen in this image in the introduction. So on the meadow next to the cathedral, we put this uh, little object, somehow trying to uh, organize and uh, emphasize a kind of a urban space which has been forgotten or put aside, somehow to stimulate and articulate a new urban spot. On the other hand side, we wanted to give a comment on the state of uh, construction uh, uh, situation in Croatia. And the third, we wanted to start a new tradition which is somehow related to the things that happen with Serpentine Pavilion. So, not every year, but every third year, the winner of Salon was supposed to build his own pavilion as a part of a touristic offer of the city. So this is the space, this is the meadow, and relation to the main square, some manipulations of the model, relation to the conceptual level, to the film made by Buster Keaton in 1920s. It's called One Week. If you have interest, you can have a look. Uh, um, and it's about a newlywed couple who got a present a prefab home and uh, before uh, assembling it, here in the middle, a jealous lover comes and changes the number on the boxes. So what happens, actually they built a monster instead of this regular house and there are a lot of different funny episodes with this house. So we are actually asking who is the one that changes the numbers, numbers on the boxes in Croatian architecture that it eventually looks so badly in the final instance. So this was a relation to the film and our idea of these aesthetics of ugly. Um, some details about the construction and the positioning of the house. Every window is different. The idea of big brother and a small brother related to each other. This awkward construction almost improvised. These are different things. The, uh, the facade was made by two mostly despised uh, elements in Croatian architecture, that is uh, rendered uh, uh, extruded polystyrene. And the next one are the plastic windows. So we took only these two materials to assemble the facade to show that even with these uh, proliferated or, or, or problematic materials that we can uh, uh, make a decent house. And this is, these are from the building process, the idea of assembling it together, and 
this is how it looked uh, in the final instance. It stood there for three months as a part of the festivities uh, related to this salon. Uh, in this year we have the 50th uh, 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 anniversary, actually the 50th edition of the Zagreb Salon and I have been uh, uh, selected as a main commissioner for the Salon and now we are in the midst of our presentations. Uh, so these are some, before I said that, these are some interior views where this uh, film by Walter Keaton has been projected in order to give some of the uh, uh, visitors the idea of this conceptual level even though they we operate on different levels so this was not necessarily the only one. Uh, some images from the inside and finally uh, I would also like to use this opportunity to announce this new uh, 50th Zagreb Salon with the idea uh, with a theme that I have chosen for this time it's called consistency based on the literature Italo Calvino and people like that. So I'm asking the Croatian architects to tell us in not more than 20, 250 words why do they think that they, their project should be shown in this edition of Salon. So I'm also trying to see how the written word works within this uh, 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 architectural discourse that uh, we are somehow responsible to show and to testify. Okay, uh, next project is about programmatic instability, contextuality, popular versus representational. In a campus in the city of Split, where I teach regularly as a professor of urban design and, and in some other uh, uh, things with, connected with uh, the history of contemporary architecture, uh, on this inclined campus, which is a very strange campus, the competition asked for a new building of the law faculty, so this is where it was supposed to be. So we started the design by looking at the circumstances of the site, trying to somehow define the, the borderlines or the outer elements uh, which somehow will condition our very site. So we started with this sort of a green belt or a green horseshoe if you want, uh, equipped with uh, student houses and these little baby towers and things like that. Then we also emphasized this axis, which was actually the part of the bigger master plan from the 70s, in order to finally arrive to the place here, sorry, I have nothing to show, uh, where the house was. So this is the black uh, squares, are, is the position of the house, actually the house with three courtyards. Position of the house, the idea of the building somehow related again to these uh, uh, lessons that we can derive out of the Ecclesian Palace. So you can see here the Roman arches, which are somehow equipped with the contemporary punched windows, which are actually showing us that even life in its uh, contemporary uh, 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 emanation uh, does not necessarily uh, uh, question the, the strength of the principal structure. So this was a kind of a lecture that we, or, or the knowledge that we somehow derived and applied to our design. So we also, as you can see, used arches. There is a kind of a bigger conceptual uh, repertoire that I'm not going to describe now because it would take too long. We are working with steps because our lobby is stepped because the site is steep. So, uh, next to this idea of how to assemble the house on a steep site, we were also working with these outer surroundings, with these courtyards. We tried to fill the house as much as we can with, in these courtyards, and we played with these uh, uh, local uh, cliches. Everyone who makes the house for tourism uh, takes the walls as a guarantee of, uh, of, of, of genuineness of the house, as something uh, attractive is something that would bring the tourists in. So uh, it is almost like a kind of a pre-script that you have to use when you uh, design at the Dalmatian coast. So we somehow, and this is for example what the gypsies do with the arches, so we took this uh, for granted and we applied arches, in this particular case the, the double uh, height arches, and actually by this we arrived at the main diagram of the whole project which shows that this outer structure can be filled in very different ways and that we as architects do not control the final outcome of the house. 
so you can see on, in some of the arches, the staircases, the balconies, the greeneries from the cut out courtyards, some of them are mute and things like that. And they can change in time and they, they would not compromise the strengths of the structure. We also work with some ephemeria which we also find in the surroundings like these plastic greenhouses that we applied in the this, uh, stepped uh, foyer of, of the faculty which you can see here in this uh, rendering. And uh, this is the final image showing how this structure can be then uh, maintained and also uh, uh, how it can be transformed in the course of time without uh, losing its intensity and uh, usability. Architecture as an educational device, the idea of the privacy generating the public as a subversion is demonstrated in a project that we did as a little kindergarten again in the suburbs of the city of Zagreb. Uh, this is the site which is definitely way too small for a kindergarten of, with, with so many groups of children. Uh, another obstacle of the site was that it was overshadowed by the huge building in the south and we designed the house as a kind of a single story structure and we moved the house away from the shadow but alas we arrived to the end of the site so we had to, what we had to do we had to bend we had to fold the house up so what has been the atrium the ground floor became a kind of a, a, a suspended terrace in the height so this was a kind of a procedure that we followed in our design and this is how this is the building on this site uh, this is the model showing the atria and, and these uh, suspended uh, gardens and terraces uh, ending up with a roof terrace because we had to use all there was in order to uh, supply uh, enough uh, spaces for the kids to play. So this is during the, the construction process, the manipulation of the digital model showing this idea. Uh, a relation to contemporary art, which we use very often in our work. Uh, uh, Dan Graham, uh, Homes for Suburban America, 1978. The idea of, of revealing what stands behind the curtains of this suburban America, but only up to the, the half of the house, then it's a mirror, which somehow reflects and hides the rest of the house. So a kind of a conceptual procedure that we also it was on the show in MoMA uh, quite recently, so I was very happy to see the model live. So actually this is the way how we relate the house to the passers-by, which observe the house and we tune the level how much uh, the view would penetrate the house and see the kids. Uh, uh, the friends of my son who live in the neighborhood call this uh, house the pedophile supermarket because actually it was uh, this sort of transparency uh, enables the people to look deep into the house but we have also a number of different curtains and ways how to stop the view when we not really need it. So this was a rendering from the competition. This is the final outcome of the project. This is the, the back side showing this idea of suspended gardens. The plan showing this sort of a street, we call it the children's street. Actually, this is the most important uh, aspect of the project because we dis regard this project as a kind of a educational device where we simulate the kindergarten as a little city uh, where uh, the kids go and they meet different people as if we're walking on the street and seeing different uh, shops with different professions. So we, uh, what we actually did, we immersed the staff deep into the kids' domain. They are not working somewhere else. So the kid, by strolling down the kids' street, could see a woman typing on a machine, uh, a landlord repairing something, someone counting the money, uh, the lady cooking the lunch, or sewing on a, on a sewing machine. So lots of a lot of different occupations and the kids relate to them so it was a kind of introduction into the real life so this was a the most experimental part of the project and it has proven to be working quite well so this sort of relating the, the, the grown-ups to the kids 
and giving them a clue uh, how people work, what are different occupations that you, they can eventually uh, uh, adopt in their future life. So this is the lady on a sewing machine and things like that. It was even our Christmas card for 28. Uh, the view from the outside, also dealing with section. These, uh, this violet color has to do with indigo child, which is another uh, tradition that I cannot go into the detail now, but somehow gives the house uh, uh, an additional uh, capacity. Uh, this this, uh, this rendered stucco also has a kind of a protective uh, uh, radiance and somehow uh, works despite of its openness as a kind of a protecting uh, sheet, sheet of the house. Here from the outside. All the, the, fa all the, fa the other facades are completely uh, closed, or mostly closed. Only the one that faces the streets where we expect a certain interaction with, with the, the passers-by is glazed and then uh, equipped with different sort of mechanical or, or, or electron electronical louvers. Okay, necessity of the iconic. I'm, uh, I was happy to be invited two months ago, and actually this is almost the same lecture that I had in LA uh, uh, at the USC, so at the University of Southern California. Uh, and actually I'm much more happy to be lecturing on that school than on other two schools that are in LA, because they actually uh, cultivate a kind of a approach to architecture which is strictly iconic, which is strictly formal, and I'm completely against this sort of uh, approach. Not only me, I suppose. So, in, but in a certain situations, in a certain environments or locations, there is a necessity to, to work within this register of iconics. So, when you uh, do a design for a main uh, national stadium, in, a, in this particular case in Croatia, then you might eventually uh, come out with a, an iconic concept. In our particular case, it was a kind of a, a, a sports hill with its own private cloud hovering above this uh, hill. So uh, we tried to uh, articulate it as a kind of a tradition of the sports hills in the city of Zagreb. The one is next to the airport, it's a big garbage depository which will be transport, transformed into a kind of a recreational zone. The next one is the mountain in the background, which uh, houses the main sporting events in World uh, Ski uh, Cup series. And the third one that we are actually proposing... Uh -huh. Sorry. The third one that we are proposing is this for the football, as a third sports hill in the city of Zagreb. So it's, uh, the, uh, the, the situation of the project is in the very uh, city center, uh, in a, next to this uh, central uh, uh, band. And this is the position of, of the house in these surroundings. And the idea of this cloud actually uh, is related to the shark, which has its own fish that cleans him. It's related to the, the US president who has its own AVAX plane who monitors the city where, where he's visiting. So it was actually the time when President Bush was in the city of Zagreb. So this is where the idea came, came with these AVAX planes. And so if he has this, why shouldn't we have that? So this was a kind of a very uh, shorthand quick reference to that. So. The city, the, the building, its, its surroundings, it can be seen as a kind of a landmark from the far, so you can even tell what is the result if you are late. Uh, the facade or, or this topography, if you want to see it like that, is uh, made out of recycled blue rubber, which is a typical color for the city of Zagreb. So this is how it sits in its surroundings some of the plans, because the, the, the building starts from the zero and then goes up, so its inclination could be used for a number of uh, sports. I've seen that you also have this ACAB here in, in one of the traffic, uh, in the, the transformator units, so you know what it means. So we made this graffiti because it's very, I would say, contextual, and the football fans like to put it, so they can even equip the house with such uh, unresponsible graffiti. Uh, so this is the way how it, this topography becomes the house, so you 
climb up to a certain level, then you find this yellow one, which then takes you up or down depending where your seats are. Uh, the roof has a special feature, I will explain it right now. You see this uh, upper part, because actually it's not simply it's private cloud, it's actually the way how to cover the pitch. Because in the program uh, we were asked to cover the stands and in the second stage to cover the pitch. So we came out with this idea of not of the sliding roof, but out of this uh, helium filled uh, sort of membrane structure, which can be guided, which can be pulled down to cover the pitch or which can be transported up in the air to show the result and to give air into the middle of, of the house. So this is the idea of the place from the inside, this is from the outside. There, there is even a cable car entering the house from the, the other part of the river. So the house is equipped with different things. This is the part that I'm particularly happy with because it's an engineering part that we worked with, with an Austrian company and we came with the idea of this double cable uh, structure and the roof is really lightweight only uh, being designed by these two uh, lines or surfaces of cables uh, which are all meeting this central uh, ring in between there is an ETF E membrane covering with polycarbonate domes and things like that on the outside you have this corrugated aluminium with sprayed rubber on that, so it's really a project. This it, it, it was estimated to be four times cheaper than the actual stadia at that time. It was 2010, I think. So this is the final view from when you approach the stadium and how it sits in the cityscape, in the city of Zagreb. Sust sustainable structure. Um, I don't know how we are with the time, I think I should uh, somehow conclude more or less. Uh, I have two projects to show, I will try to make it very quickly. One is, the, we are uh, recently, in the last couple of years, working uh, quite uh, intensively with sustainability, with our engineers coming from Belgrade, because we don't have such specialists in Croatia, so we are somehow forced to collaborate from the outside. And, and this is the first project uh, showing uh, our collaboration for a new pharmaceutical faculty in the city of Zagreb. This is where the site was. So we somehow are trying to frame the part of, the, of this existing wood and somehow to put the house into it. We are also working with reference and uh, Paul Clay came to help to show us how to build a castle in the forest. Uh, we also asked Gerhard Richter and Pete Mondrian what do they have to say about that. When we somehow designed this for new uh, artificial forest made out of these mushroom uh, uh, structures, which also have reference to the examples that you are probably familiar with, maybe not with this one, which was done by some Spanish architects for the expo. So we came with this, the idea of, or you probably know this one by Foster, uh, but for Repsol. So we came with this idea of these mushroom uh, columns that are somehow interpreting the, uh, the nature in, a, in another way, as a third nature if you want. And what is new and what is uh, clearly showing that it's not 1930s where the, the Svax or Sin uh, uh, plant was made, is a kind of a way how we equip these mushrooms with sustainability uh, aspects. This is how the structures are, are organized under this canopy of, of concrete mushrooms, somehow harmonizing with, uh, with the, the existing forest. There is almost a kind of a non-existent uh, glazed uh, perimeter of the house, relating to some works of Lina Bobardi and people like that, and some other examples that we know from Europe. So this is the, maybe the important image showing that we equipped uh, this structure, which is uh, a structural part of the house, of course, but also all uh, these uh, engineering systems are within these mushrooms, so you don't see them. There's always a problem how to articulate the house with these uh, mostly awful uh, photovoltaic panels, so we put them all within this hidden uh, uh, part of the structure and some other things that we 
put here in order to make the house sustainable as much as it can. Uh, and this is how it sits in its surroundings. So these are some images of the house and the structures which are below. We even left the, the existing terrain to be a kind of natural slope, so we do not make it even. The, the, the house goes down with the existing terrain, you can see it here. from that and we uh, finally we did the CFD analysis I don't know how much uh, uh, familiar you are with this this is called uh, computational flow dynamics it's a it's a software which somehow helps us to simulate all the uh, environmental conditions in order to be able to see the extent of, of efficiency of our structure in terms of engineering systems so these are excerpts of this CFD analysis showing that we somehow managed quite a good uh, result with that. The idea of putting the plants on the facade as a kind of a, a regulator of shadow, the idea of hydroponics that could be well uh, articulated in a house that do, does with plants, with pharmaceutical plants, so we thought that making them on a facade could be a kind of a identity of the house, but at the same time a kind of part of this uh, environmental structure. So this was the project, and I will, if you allow me, very quickly show the final project, where we demonstrate low-tech sustainability, sustainable territory, and typological shift. So the idea is that actually uh, uh, sustainability functions much better in a territory. The architects and engineers today are mostly engaged in making sustainable buildings, but only a few of them are really relating to the sustainable territories. And territory, by the virtue of being big and, 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 and there, actually offers us a number of possibilities to make uh, the energy uh, consumption uh, much lower than that we can do with the house itself. We demonstrated this, uh, for me at the time, new uh, revelating thought in a project we named Park B. It's a new uh, university campus, a competition that we won in 2011 for the city of Zagreb. The, the history of the University of Zagreb is very long, or relatively long. It, it goes back to the uh, mid-17th century. It has different campuses in the city. Here in, the, in this master plan you see the position of, the, of, of our site. The site is relatively big, it has 90 hectares. It's a former military uh, area which was then made redundant after the homeland war. These are the campuses in the city of Zagreb, ending up with ours. This is actually the situation as it is today with, with these uh, military structures which have been repurposed for some educational purposes. This was actually the site which was heavily shelled and bombed during the World War II because it was a kind of a runway for the planes. So the brief in the, of the competition clearly asked, give us the future. So actually this is what we, are, we took quite seriously, but before we went to the future we were turning a bit back, looking at what has been done in terms of sustainable territories so far. And an inevitable example also, of course, is the Broadacre City by Frank Lloyd Wright, which has a number of issues that, according to my opinion, are not so well known and not so researched as they should have been. Also in, in MoMA recently there was a, this huge model to be seen, so I really enjoyed uh, checking out the different aspects of this incredible project. And even his drawings show this idea of this flash cordon sort of aesthetics, these naive aesthetics of what the future can bring us. Uh, so we thought, let's, let's go into this, uh, let's try to assemble something. Here you see the site uh, in a relation with some green fingers, which are typical for the development of the city of Zagreb. So we somehow included our site, which is here in the middle, into the system of green trajectories which connect the mountain with the river. We also deal, dealt with infrastructure, so is it, park, is it parking as Banksy uh, uh, suggests us, so it's not very clear where one starts and the other begins. 
If for some of you who have still enough energy, this was our intro into the project. So I will give you a half a minute to read it through. And actually the people uh, commented, you cannot win the competition when you can't come with such insulting words to uh, your counterparts and uh, the administration. But we thought it was very important to uh, show that actually the ambition of the project has to have different levels. That we cannot always go to the, the final uh, instance. That we have to uh, somehow uh, organize ourselves even if we, as the text suggests, even if we make a little piece of the park and if the buildings eventually do not come in the first instance. Our orientation is green and left, so we try to demonstrate it in our project. Next to this Borongai, as it, this campus is called, is a 18th century English park uh, as a kind of a reference for our project as well. So this is the layout of the whole project, actually articulated with three, we call them flowers, three zones of, of uh, uh, structures. On your left hand side you have a startup cluster, these little pills, and here you have the greenhouses, which actually are the fa new faculties. These are the layers of the project, I'm not going to describe it into the into detail, this is the idea of architecture or urbanism as a project, which starts as a meadow, continues as a kind of a structured way of, 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 of forested ways and parts that uh, remain clear. With the first buildings, with the organization of the path, it gradually throws, goes on until the final saturation. This is, these are the buildings that are to be constructed, different layers again some views of the site. This is this idea where we catch up with Frank Lloyd Wright, where we are trying to make this multitude of different layers, giving you a hint of different activities, all happening simultaneously next to each other. So we designed this uh, flowing path that you can see, which can be frozen in the winter, so you can ice skate here. There's a strange object flowing there, I will tell it uh, very soon what it is like skating in the channels in, 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 in Holland. Or you can paddle along these uh, uh, waterways in summer, like they do in, in other campuses, for example in Cambridge. Then an idea, sorry, uh, that we have to occupy the site because you are probably uh, coming out of a society where corruption and, and uh, misorganization uh, is not so unknown to you. So we have to also uh, devise strategies how to cope against that as architects. So we knew if we leave all the sites open that there will be a lot of mishandling and some sites will be sold to some individuals. So we have to make sure that we have some place holding structures. So what we are proposing here is actually to occupy the sites with the existing glass houses. And when there is a necessity to, to make a faculty, then this glass house is dismantled and the faculty, which is also a kind of a new age glass house, takes place there. So this is a kind of a, again, a kind of a gradual process of taking the, the original glass houses and changing them with the new ones. The idea of urban agriculture is something that you are probably familiar with. It's, it's a kind of a commonplace already. So we also introduce this as a kind of a a socializing integration factor where students, neighbors, professors and staff all work together in this sort of new urban uh, agriculture. There is a huge territory which necessarily needs a third dimension. So we uh, invented this idea of this flowing cloud that flows over this whole campus and gives a number of features that are beneficial for the campus. So actually it's kind of a floating structure which we found just one kilometer away from the, from the site. There is a fantastic young startup company who produces such floating ships for mostly uh, meteorological reasons. But uh, we contacted them and somehow devised, so here they, they are in the lab, and we somehow devised a strategy how we can use these things in order to have light, in order to have uh, shadow, in order to have protection against rain, in order to have sound, 
or if you want if even uh, surveillance. So these are the multifunctional elements. You can see them here in this rendering, hovering over the grand axis of the whole uh, campus. The idea, which is not so unknown in architecture, for the new uh, football championship in, in, in Qatar, they are also thinking about some uh, shadow providing device. The drones are already on every corner, so this sort of technology that would be lifted in the air and somehow electronically conducted is not something which is completely uh, alien. And then this uh, uh, part which has to do with sustainability, and this is the final part of the project, actually deals how we wrap these greenhouses in a successful way and how we leave the space between these uh, uh, forested parts where the air flows through these channels of, of 20 meters width, at which somehow cools uh, the, the clusters and somehow they enter the clusters, as you can see here, because this is the way of predominant wind, north-south. Uh, the forests that encompass the clusters are uh, the evergreens in the north and the ones that lose leaves in the south, because in summer the leaves uh, uh, give us the shadow and in the winter uh, the, the necessary winter sun uh, warms the building. So we somehow used uh, these natural processes to optimize uh, the shadow of the house. Again, we have this CFD analysis which shows how the house perform or the, how the clusters perform with or without the forest or how do they perform also in terms not of, of, of uh, temperature but also in terms of acoustics. We also introduced some geothermal energy into the project and some other things that I cannot speak about now. And coming out finally to this uh, final uh, sheet, which uh, give us a clue that in terms of heating, cooling and electricity, with the, with the measures that we applied, that we are covering the, at least 50% of the demand. These are the organizations of the clusters as such, giving urban rules to how to organize these uh, stripes within the greenhouse. Also uh, trying to organize a new uh, uh, educational structure which would somehow stimulate the people to work together. So you can see this view from this airship to one of these clusters. So you see this com communication of of educational, uh, uh, residential parts, cafes, bicycles, courtyards, everything somehow is mixed together within these uh, green clusters and would eventually uh, become a kind of a optimal uh, work, uh, educational space. Final image is uh, the exhibition of uh, after the competition where these guys from the startup even lent us these flowing uh, uh, ship which was hovering in the exhibition area somehow testifying that this future is just around the corner. Finally, buy our books. One of them is dealing with four creation offices called Peripheral Moment by Actar Barcelona and the other one is 2G which is a kind of a recent monograph of our office. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I would turn to the public if anybody has a question. If you are not completely devastated by the length of the lecture, I would appreciate some questions. Hello, and thank you for the lecture. Uh, I had a question about the teaching and how does uh, the teaching influence your work? Uh, it was a recent question for one of the magazines and I think it's very important. I think it's a, a very, uh, I, I would say it's a privilege that you can teach, that you can check out your ideas with the students. In the other hand side, it keeps you awake, it keeps you alert, you cannot afford to stay aside. You are probably familiar with a lot of the colleagues which already in their 30s stop any sort of uh, self-education and keep perpetuating what they have learned in the school for the next 50 years, right? 
So for me personally, it's a it's a fine opportunity, especially uh, uh, teaching in, in different places. Uh, uh, for example, the 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 influences or uh, the the feedback that you get in South America for the work or for the teaching you provide there is completely different from the U.S. or from Asia. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a very privileged situation where you can check out your ideas and that you can uh, uh, somehow work with the students on, a, on a, I would say, a real-time basis. When I say that, I think that uh, for the design studio, I think it's essential that you build and you practice as an architect. If you don't, then it's very questionable what you can offer as an educator to them. Another question which is a bit related to this iconic uh, architecture and maybe to... Uh, also First of all, do you agree with, with, with me? Uh, yes, with this? thank you, thank you. You do? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. First of all on that. Okay, yeah. I actually I had a chance to see you before I used to study in Graz. Aha, uh -huh. okay, okay, great, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't mention that, that I was actually uh, from 2000 until 2005 I was a regular professor in Graz, uh, and I'm very proud to say that I actually uh, succeeded in, in my chair the, the famous Austrian architect, the late uh, Austrian architect Günther Domenik. You may be not familiar with that uh, name, but uh, I can assure you that he was one of the finest that Austria had in the second half of the 20th century. Okay, so I appreciate that. You, you have some questions from that time? or? Yeah, I'm against formalism in architecture, and I think that when you look in these, uh, only you take some websites which are very popular today, uh, Design, uh, uh, Art Daily, or things like that, there's a lot of crap, I would say 90% of crap architecture that has been produced on a really daily basis, like a kind of a, Art Daily is also almost like a McDonald's of architecture, right? So. I would also try, I, I'd like to uh, uh, speak about it with my students and somehow to uh, wake a certain sensitivity with them to observe it with, with special attention. Because I really don't think that we should, first of all, be engaged with form as our ultimate goal. That the form should be generated by all other issues that I somehow demonstrate, I hope I demonstrated in my presentation. <clears throat> and that only iconic makes sense in certain situations. For example, uh, I uh, am. Uh, I think that the work of Zaha Hadid can uh, serve us as a good example for that. In some situations, when she's building this incredible cultural center for this uh, uh, dictator somewhere in, in Azerbaijan or something yeah. like this, then I think it's perfectly okay to come up with some sort of a extravagant form as a demonstration of this cultural center as the the building that somehow represent this new state. But uh, when she does this sort of uh, uh, dance in when she designs the housing or schools, like for example she, what she recently did in Vienna, uh, then it becomes, or in, in London, then it becomes problematic. And I'm, I was really pleased to read that after that the Ministry of Education in UK ban the curved buildings, educational buildings. So I think it's a big, big success that the architects are being told that they should design straight when they are asked to do some sort of purposeful buildings. But if you do the icon, if you make something which is really very important on a very important location, then I think that you can afford yourself to be a bit more, more uh, identifying the spot and the one to stand behind it. Thank you. Um, <coughs> about uh, the process of work, uh, which sometimes can... can uh, uh, the process of work, I think it's an interesting question because I think it's very, uh, I would say it's very in, uh, intuitional. It, it has to do with intuition. You know, it's a very popular word with IT specialists that the uh, software is... I'm only relating this question because, uh, because we also saw uh, lots of different kind of uh, projects. Yeah. Like you have straight lines but you also have... Uh, yeah, I think I cannot say that I'm against uh, curved lines or for the straight lines, and I think it's very important to somehow to uh, uh, 
create a kind of a contextual basis for what you do, either coming from the realm of engineering or from the realm of popular culture or for something else. I think it's important to have a kind of a story. I would say discourse. Discourse is a very uh, mystical word that most of the students don't know what to start with. So I try to do, in my teaching, I try to make sure that they at least understand the word discourse. So in my discourse, I try to somehow tell a little story and to equip this story with different elements that I intuitively find along the way and add them to the story. Some of them later on maybe fall apart because they are not so crucial, but somehow I think every project is another chance to do something. So I really uh, think that becoming stylistically uh, recognizable or typical to say, you work in that style, like this or that architect. I think it's very dangerous, I think it's very wrong, and I think that every project is a new uh, opportunity to uh, uh, start questioning the very essence of architecture from the scratch. Thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you for the nice questions. Uh, the I think in your response to the um, previous question, I found something very interesting. You said there's a lot of crap architecture out there. So I'd like to know from you, what in your opinion uh, makes good architecture? Uh, what, what makes good architecture? Yes. Uh, I think maybe I, I already have uh, offered a half of the answer in my previous question that I think that uh, architecture has to be somehow argumented. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there are some I would say uh, master builders or architects, uh, artists that somehow do not necessarily have to uh, acknowledge their processes, that they are geniuses as such, and that they are actually working in a register that is actually not valid for the other 99% of architects. By saying that, I think of the people like uh, Peter Zumthor, who somehow has a completely different discourse in architecture, who doesn't give a damn about this sort of uh, dealing with ecology, dealing with uh, uh, technology of the facade, dealing with urbanity. He just does his building, whatever, and he doesn't care, right? So, but there's not so many Zoom tours around these days, and it's, it, it really becomes very uh, uh, pathetic when uh, Architects uh, somehow fall in love with their imagery. Take Frank Gehry, for example, who started at, recently in LA. I saw his own house, and I think it's definitely his best work, or the house that he built in this Santa Monica uh, walkway. And when he started to, to, to develop his stuff all over the globe, always repeating the same thing, uh, I think that this then it became very problematic, right? So, uh, for some of the, the architects, as I said, who have this aura of, of, of uniqueness, I could uh, understand that there is uh, a very mysterious or no discourse behind it. But for 99% of us, and I count myself definitely into these other 99% of the people, uh, I think that we should somehow, as I said, make a kind of a clear uh, uh, strategy what the project is all about. So I deeply believe uh, in the apology that most of the architecture has, can, uh, have, uh, can use the apology as a device to uh, offer a new answer. I also believe that uh, we as architects are uh, somehow obliged to uh, uh, open new questions and open new ways, that we are obliged to experiment, that we are obliged to uh, 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 comment on the time that in the space that we work in. So these are all the ingredients that somehow uh, 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 could uh, shape uh, your project. I don't think that there is a clear uh, uh, recipe for one place or the other, but somehow this idea of, of uniqueness and, and uh, has to uh, come out of, of, of different situations, as I said, out of the context out of the necessity to research, out of the necessity to comment the time and the space where you work, and by doing so, 
I think that uh, a fair architecture can evolve. Even if we call it an everydayness architecture, like for example, like Smithson did, uh, it is a kind of a decent architecture which doesn't necessarily speaks very loudly or doesn't won't be remembered by many, especially non-professionals. But somehow, I think uh, uh, the procedure and the discourse have to be clear. Thanks. Uh, here. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>